I'm Jess, and it's so great to be with you for a few moments today. Welcome to Kingston Standard Church, our online version. I'd love to invite you to connect with us online or in person. If you're in the Kingston area, come on out. We would love to see you. If you're limited to online connection, though, not a problem. Just be sure to check out our website for at-home worship resources. But in the description box of this video, you're going to find the link to our website. As well, you can always follow us on YouTube and like us on Facebook and be sure to subscribe to both so that you'll stay up to date on all the new content when it's posted. We have a variety of resources available to families and kids on both Facebook and YouTube. So if this is your first time joining us, or if you've been here before, we want to encourage you to go ahead and check that out because our mission is to equip families for the conversations that they have together to learn and grow and follow Jesus. And if you want to touch base personally, then feel free to reach out. You can send us a message on Facebook or you can use the address below. So let's dive in and see what we're going to learn about today. It is always an honor to teach the Bible with you uh, and to be with you today. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our church online. Uh, we are getting into a new series this month on grit, which is, I mean, it's always exciting to think about the kind of personality traits we have and where that comes from, how are they formed. So I wanted to begin by just giving kind of a preamble or a warning to say that very frequently when we think about whether it be grit, patience, love, whatever it is, uh, the way a, the world defines a character trait uh, is very different than how I think Jesus defines it, or at least how we find it in scripture. And so just because we see a, the word grit, we don't necessarily need to think of, you know, burly cowboys and, uh, and uh, big hairy arms or something. But uh, grit, it, it, I, I think, is so much deeper. And, and part of grit, I would argue, and today we're going to focus on, is the sense of patience, being able to endure uh, through difficult times, uh, being able to hold on for a long time. Uh, so that's what we're going to focus on today, thinking about grit, particularly through the lens of patience, what it means to be a godly person who responds to adversity, to challenging situations, and to be able to do that again and again, to keep showing up, to keep being there for the people around you. In order to do that, I've chosen to look at a guy uh, called Nehemiah. I don't know if you're familiar with Nehemiah. Uh, it's an extraordinary leader in the Bible. So we're going to look at the book of Nehemiah together. If you've got a moment, if you've got a Bible at home or you want to pull it up on your computer, Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to go. As you're flipping your pages, trying to get there, uh, a couple, sort of, again, preamble remarks about Nehemiah. For most of the, the time of, that the Bible was put together, Nehemiah and the book that precedes it, Ezra, were actually one book. Ezra and Nehemiah, it's all combined. And those three, uh, or those two books, they kind of include three stories or three columns that kind of go through this cycle of uh, the, first, uh, the first leader, Zerubbabel, uh, looking to rebuild the temple. And then Ezra rebuilding the community. And then you get to the third act in this sort of great saga. Uh, and it's Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And all of that is set at the backdrop of um, the, the people of Israel, the ancient Israelites, living in captivity. And they're living uh, in Iran or Babylon. Uh, and they're, they have this hope, this desire that one day God will, will allow them to go back to their homeland. And so you see these three phases as Zerubbabel, Ezra, and then Nehemiah build different parts of the community back up. It's also something of a tragic story because by the end of it, much of their work is undone. Uh, but I think that's part of the human nature of these stories. So the last preamble before we begin to read is that just because we see someone in Scripture doesn't mean that everything they do is right. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the Scriptures that we have as Christians is that they include real people getting involved in real things. And in this case, I think what we'll see is Nehemiah does his best. He's very human and we see his weaknesses on display throughout the entire book, but he does his best. And so I think, although I would give caution to say, be careful to turn basically anyone but Jesus into your heroes from the scriptures, there's real human messiness in the book. But Nehemiah is pretty good. And the thing that always strikes me about him is how his story starts. So Nehemiah chapter one, uh, this is where I like to begin with uh, and just see as we work, work through both the sense of patience and grit and what it means to be a godly follower uh, of the way. So here's how it begins. Uh, Nehemiah chapter one, the first verse. The words of Nehemiah, the son of 
Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the twelfth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from, with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So this sort of situates us in the story. This is a story about Nehemiah. It tells that in the verse first. And it tells us where it's taking place in the city of Susa. That's ancient, uh, that's ancient Babylon, but modern-day Persia. So for those of you who know our story, we lived about five hours away from uh, Susa for about eight years of our lives. And that's about the distance from here in Kingston, Ontario, to Quebec City. So this was a world that we were vaguely familiar with. Uh, and it's important to say that the story is starting outside of Nehemiah's homeland. Nehemiah, like so many others of his generation of Israelites, were in captivity. They were being held against their will away from their home people. And so on this particular day, Nehemiah bumps into some people from the old country, from, from Jerusalem, and says, I don't know what he meant by the question, but oh, how are things at home? What's going on? Like, tell me what's going on in Jerusalem. How are the people? How's everybody doing? Um, and the, the response or the reaction certainly unsettles Nehemiah. And we'll, we'll see that in just a second. If we, if we continue to read, uh, this is what the next part says. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile, they're in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. It's not a good day. Nehemiah is going about his day and, and the way any of us uh, usually do. And you bump into someone, hey, how's it going, man? What's, what's life at home? And immediately struck with this news of devastation of the, the gates being on fire and the walls and crumbles and just, it's not good. And reaction is everything here. And, and so before we get to his reaction, I would say, I think we really do live in a current world where we have become numb to so much of the, the suffering, so many of the stories that um, can be heartbreaking that we hear from around the world. Uh, immediately, uh, as I read this, I think, how would we, we react? And the, the truth of it is so many of us would just keep scrolling. You'd hear terrible news and go, oh, goodness, that's awful. Oh, it's a cute cat. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh, it's a funny meme. And we're on our phones and we're getting this mix of horrific tragedy globally and, and funny stories. And we become numb to the pain of this world. Um, and, and so I say that to say that when we read this, Nehemiah has just heard that his homeland is in rubble. And, and it's... It should be deeply moving. And, and for me, I, I wonder if I was these friends who told Nehemiah, what would I be looking for? What kind of support would I want from Nehemiah? Uh, if, you, if you got a friend that you tell someone uh, something tragic, what are they going to do with it? To be honest, some friends are really good at offering, you know, shoulder to cry on. Say, hey, man, come here like this. We got this together. Uh, some friends are like, hey, tell me more. Like, how can I be there with you? Um, I'm someone who likes friends to, to actually get involved and do something. Like if I tell you something that's grieving me or hurting me, like <laughs> offer to help. Um, that, that's immediately what I would think is the good answer, right? Like I, I don't know what you think is the right answer here. It's worth pausing to think about before we read Nehemiah's answer. But what is it when you share the worst news that you've ever encountered? What kind of reaction are you looking for? And conversely, when you hear the worst news ever, when you hear tragedy, when you hear suffering, what is it that you do to respond to that person? This is what Nehemiah does, and, and I find it striking. Uh, this is in verse 4. It says this, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I began by talking about how frequently when we think of grit and, and these kinds of uh, traits, they can sometimes be associated with a sort of macho, manly man, like, you know, real men don't cry. Um, I love that Nehemiah's response here is that when he hears of brokenness in the world, his heart is broken and he is moved to tears. He actually cares. He reacts emotionally. And, and so I would argue here that grit is not about being so closed off to the suffering of the world that we can just suffer through but rather being able to be broken by brokenness, being able to have our, our hearts open to the suffering of this world. Because I, I do think that's the way of Jesus, that we would allow our, ourselves emotionally, physically to be moved 
by compassion. And, and, and that, that might lead to action, but to begin with, we are moved by compassion. Nehemiah weeps. We hear the same passage uh, or, or, or similar uh, language with Jesus weeping. There's a realness, a tangible pain that's in the, the air. Nehemiah hears of the suffering of his people and he weeps. I got to say, I think, um, and, and this is on line with grit, but I think we maybe don't cry enough. I, I, hope, you mean, I hope you get what I mean by that. We, we are not moved by the brokenness of this world. We, we swipe up and we just keep going. And that, that's sometimes a, a way to protect our hearts, protect because we've been hurt. We don't have the, the scope to hear the kind of uh, pain of this world. Nehemiah teaches us something here that I think is beautiful. He doesn't jump to action, which is my instinct. He doesn't even jump to, to comfort these people, at least not as we read it. His immediate action is to weep, to mourn, to fast, and to pray. How often is that our response? Even in, in a microcosm, how often are we truly moved to tears? Truly emotionally from the, from the gut, how, how often do we react to something and just weep? I think as we follow Jesus, we probably should allow our hearts to be broken more often. Just this week, as I was reading something for work, and uh, if you're not familiar, I work for an organization called Bethany Kids, and we provide surgery. We do extraordinary work across the continent of Africa. Last year alone, we had almost 5,000 kids get surgery through our ministry. Um, uh, almost, well, almost 500 of them uh, came to be connected to churches because of the work that we do. Uh, and those are first-time believers, people following Jesus because of this ministry. Uh, but because I'm engaged in this work, I hear a lot of stories of brokenness, and it's really hard to swipe past. This last week, um, someone messaged me a story of a little boy named Christian, and this is in the country of Uganda. Uh, and for the first couple of days of his life, he was on oxygen. So right away, there were problems that everybody knew. This isn't good. He's on oxygen. And the family suffering through months trying to figure out, what do we do with this boy? How do we seek healing? Uh, going to herbalists and traditional bone set settlers and all sorts of things that uh, if you're familiar with modern medicine, you'd know that you're probably not going to get anywhere, not for his condition. Uh, and one of the, the most horrific uh, parts of this story is that at some point someone told the parents that really the only way to fix this spinal issue is to get metal really, really hot so you can burn his back. And by burning his back, the insides will sort of reset. So they took this eight-month-old and just burned them, hoping that they'd find healing. And, and you, you hear stories like this, and, and you weep, and, and you should be broken, because this is a beautiful child made in God's image. And the, the best resources at hand in their mind was to burn this kid in order to heal him. It was some time later that they came to Bethany Kids, heard of our work, and within two sessions with our therapist, this kid was able to sit up straight, was able to do something he had not been able to do for his entire life up until this point. And he was able to sit up straight for 20 minutes at a time. And it, and it just grieves me, both because of the tragedy of uh, parents feeling compelled to burn this kid, and also the fact that there are resources, there are Christians out there doing good work, and we just don't always tell their stories. And, and they suffer with, with lack of resources. So as I read this, as I was thinking about today, preparing Nehemiah, I was thinking about just this week, how I look and read this story and thought, man, my heart is broken. And, and our hearts, you know, we want to rush to action. But first, if you want to have true grit of God, your heart should be broken for the brokenness of this world. Allow the emotions, the reality of our spirit to be broken. What comes next is interesting because, again, you might think Nehemiah is going to jump in action now. He's wasted enough time praying and fasting. But almost the rest of the chapter here is just Nehemiah praying. So we, we actually get a copy of his prayer. And I want to read it too because this is still is Nehemiah chapter 1. So he's heard the news. He's wept. He's fasted. And then after a couple of days, he says this. And I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. 
Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the outermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your by, by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight and fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. A significant portion of chapter 1. It's just Nehemiah's prayer. And in fact, if you read this prayer and you're a scholar of the Bible, as many of you perhaps are, much of this is actually just uh, copy and paste it from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Nehemiah is praying prayers that had been spoken for centuries. They speak of God's faithfulness. And I love his posture here in the midst of tragedy. His initial reaction isn't, God, you're the worst. Why did you allow this to happen? But his initial reaction is like, God, you're faithful. We've seen your faithfulness generation after generation. We need you to show up. We need you to be here because this is dire. And then he goes on. It's interesting. So far as we read Nehemiah, like he seems like a pretty good dude. But then he goes on to say, man, this is my fault. I've sinned. Me and my family. Like He takes responsibility and blame, even though, to be honest, I'm not sure it's his fault. But he's willing to say, God, my, whatever my part has been, uh, you know, forgive us. We, we confess. And then moves on to the sort of third part of his prayer to say, you've been faithful, so be faithful to your servant today and grant me the ear of the king. For whatever comes next, grant me your favor. And that's the end of chapter one. What follows is interesting because he still doesn't just run out into action. He's still this man of peace and, and patience and true grit. He's a guy who's listening to God and what he's saying, but also responding emotionally. In fact, he's so moved emotionally that over the coming days after he prays this prayer, he's serving the king and he's out at a party. And uh, the king's like, Nehemiah, why are you down? And that's got to be odd to you, right? The, the king wouldn't normally care about a foreign servant slave bringing him drinks and him looking a little depressed. But the king says, Nehemiah, like, what's up? You look down. What's going on? That's odd, right? So I would argue that probably the hand of God is in that. The king cares, okay? Maybe the prayer is being answered. And Nehemiah just pours his heart out. Like, man, my, my country's in ruin. Uh, the people are, are hurting. I don't know what to do. And the king's like, no, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll hook you up. What do you need? Oh, you want to go back? I'll, I'll, I'll send lumber. I'll send money. Like, no problem. Here's some letters so you get a safe passage. That's wild. That, and, and it happens rapidly. Like the action in the story is pretty slow in chapter one. But once it kicks off, Nehemiah is off. He's inspecting the walls by night and he's checking the place out and then building it, building uh, collaborations across uh, boundaries and extraordinary. The whole book is really interesting. But it begins with a really lengthy pause to say, man, this, this is awful. This is rough. And just weeping, fasting, mourning and praying. So as we step back from this and think, okay, this is you know, millennia ago, this is, uh, um, this is 2,500 years or so before, Jesus, before now, uh, what does that have to do today? We're not rebuilding walls necessarily. Where I think it's beautiful, we come back to this question of grit. What is the characteristic of Nehemiah that we can pull away? Patience is not just waiting forever. And patience isn't rushing, but being able to actually have your hearts broken to God have your heart's brokenness to the brokenness around this world, I think begins to allow us to sort of sync up with God. Because we know that as Christians, we serve a God who loves people, who cares about those who are suffering. And so when we enter that space and care for those who are suffering with God, the world begins to change. Opportunities begin to present themselves as it did for Nehemiah. So what does it mean to be true grit? I'm sure over the coming weeks, we'll learn more. But as I see it in Nehemiah, I see patience and I see a willingness to have your hearts broken, to not be so 
cold and numb, not be so white knuckle on the steering wheel to get through tough times, but to get through those tough times by being vulnerable, by being emotionally available to the brokenness of this world. As I look to Christ, I see the same model. His body was broken so that we might be free. And I think he invites us into that same posture to allow our hearts and even our bodies to be broken for those around us. If we want to follow Jesus, if we want to follow the example of Nehemiah, I pray today that as we seek to model these characteristics, that our hearts would be broken to the suffering of this world, that we would, in that moment, look to God. And as a result of that posture, that we would become agents of change in this world so that we might see that brokenness healed. Uh, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for your scripture, I'm thankful for the teaching that we can glean, thankful for the men and women whose stories are recorded in this book, people like Nehemiah, that we can look to and see how one person tried to follow you with faithfulness, with patience, and with grit. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Peter. In the next few moments, we're going to participate together in communion. And so if you need to pause a video to gather some elements right now, then feel free to do that. We're reminded in the scripture that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he took that bread, he broke it. And there's a significant amount of symbolism that is a part of that, isn't there? That Jesus was broken for us and he said this is my body that's broken for you when you eat this remember me let's eat together the bible also says that in the same way, as the supper was kind of wrapping up, he took the cup and he said, this represents a brand new arrangement, a new covenant is what he said, which meant this is a new agreement between God and man. This blood is now present to refresh you, to cleanse you. And when you drink it, remember me. Let's drink together. Lord, we are so grateful to you for your sacrifice on the cross. It, uh, it humbles us every time we think of it. We recognize again in this moment our part in your life and how this beautiful remembrance and this beautiful almost like little meal, so to speak, is a reminder of our participation in the divine life the life that you bring to our lives, the life that you transform in us and, and allow to flow through us. And you continue to equip us for the work that you have in store for us here in this place and in this time and how you're working through us. And so God, we thank you and we bless your name today and we are so grateful for the way that we are able to be a part of what you're doing in the world. We love you. We thank you. We pray your blessing on this day. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channels, or if you're watching this on Facebook, then you can like and follow us there. And it would mean so much to us if you took a moment to comment, like, and share this video so that others are able to enjoy it as well. And hey, if you're in the Kingston area, come on in. We would love to see you. Please know, though, that you are loved and that we're praying for you. And we certainly appreciate your prayers, too. We'll see you soon.